All right, th this is part three now. Uh, we be began part one by talking about the helium-4 energy levels, and we used the Heisenberg energy time uncertainty principle to come up with an estimate for what the magnetometer sensitivity was, and we came up with 1 over 4 pi times a relaxation time, which is associated with the energy levels we talked about, and gamma, the gyromagnetic uh, ratio for any species, but we talked in particular about helium-4. In part two, we talked about a helium-4 optically pumped magnetometer system, like one that was used by the Navy in anti-submarine warfare. And now in part three, we want to talk about some issues related to the Heisenberg energy time uncertainty principle. And in all these three parts, and possibly a fourth part later, I just want to say this is done in memory of a friend of mine, uh, Don King. He and I worked on optically pumped magnetometers for a uh, long time. One of them in particular was the ASQ81 system, and then we worked on things uh, beyond that. So in memory of Don, we're going to continue on here now. So for part three, what we want to do is we want to take a look at the energy time uncertainty principle. Delta energy, del time greater than or equal to h bar over 2, and h bar is h over 2 pi. Now everybody is more or less familiar with the uncertainty principle of delta x, delta px, being greater than or equal to h bar over 2. Now we can look at some issues here. x and p, they follow a canonical commutator relationship. Meaning that x comma px is the commutator relationship, and that's equal to i h bar, maybe with a minus sign. No, that's right, i h bar. And uh, if we look at this, uh, there's a way to get to the delta x delta px. Um, it's going to be one half, see it'll be greater than or equal to, one half the uh, commutator relationship And with that being IH, that will be then one-half H bar. So that's one of the ways of looking at how the delta X, delta PX come about. And the important, important part is that the X and the PX, in quantum mechanics, they are operators. So in these Heisenberg uncertainty relationships, these quantities represent operators. Now when we go to the delta E, delta T, we have E energy and T time. And ask yourself, what are the operators? Well, the energy will have the operator, the Hamiltonian. But what is the operator for time? And that's where some of the issues pop up. Time 
as a parameter. One of the things uh, we can take a look at too So I'm just looking at a justification for that uh, delta E delta T because we use that with the optically pumped magnetometer to get the uh, sensitivity capabilities. Now uh, let's imagine that we have a wave packet moving along and we ask the question, what was what is the change of energy as the wave packet goes past some spot? So we can kind of start out by thinking of kinetic energy being one half mv squared for the wave packet. But since we're talking in a quantum mechanical sense, we'll look at the energy, and we would like to write this in momentum we want to put in a P, P equals MV. And to do that, we would then have one half M over P squared. That would be a way to write that. And uh, we could say that d e d p is equal to taking the derivative with respect to p. The twos will cancel out, and we'll wind up with p over m. And if we write that in terms of deltas we would have, taking the dp over for a delta p, would have a delta e is equal to p over m delta p. And to be correct here, I should carry an x, sub x. And now let's say in the case of the time, the time is going to be equal to um, some position divided by the velocity. And again, we'll indicate x. And if we do a uh, dt dx, just as we did with the E. So we do a dt dx, and we're going to get 1 over dx. And then if we do the delta again, take the dx over, we'll have delta t equals dx over vx. But we want to write the vx in terms of momentum. So if we do that, We'll put a P down in the denominator, but then we need an M in the numerator. So now you see if we take the delta E times the delta T, put all this together, that will equal, I'm going to carry X here again for the momentum. We'll wind up with the M and the PX will cancel out, so we wind up with See, I want to write this as a delta t, delta x. They'll cancel out and we'll wind up with delta px, delta x. And we know that that is, from everything we learned about in quantum mechanics, is h bar squared over 2. So this is kind of a way to show that relationship. Another 
interesting way to look at it is in terms of no there's no there's theorem and no 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 there's theorem does a symmetry uh, between uh, does a connection between symmetry and conservation laws And so in the case of symmetry regarding time in, in some sense, that corresponds to a conservation law involving energy. And then in terms of position, that involves a conservation law in terms of momentum. So we have x, px, which we had over here. We have te. So there's, there's sort of a connection there. But as to whether or not delta E delta T is real, there's a very interesting thing to look at, and that's called the Casimir effect. And the Casimir effect involves the vacuum state using delta E delta T greater than or equal to H bar over 2. And the vacuum state means that particles can appear out of nothing. Uh, a particle and its antiparticle can appear out of nothing, destroy one another, disappear, and the process is repeated and repeated and repeated. So the vacuum is not really nothing. It's full of all these particles appearing and disappearing. And there's a very interesting thing to show some reality to this. At, and that is, if you take two plates, let me see if I can draw this. So here's one plate. And we're going to draw another plate. So we have two plates very close together. And we're going to put them extremely close together. These are extremely flat plates. And we're going to put them within about 10 nanometers of one another. Extremely small distance. It turns out that if you do that, and there's been some experiments, not exactly like this, but there, there's a pressure on those two plates and it for the 10 nanometer spacing it actually works out to about one atmosphere rather remarkable and what happens is if you look between these plates the delta E delta T allows certain states to occur in there but a lot more on the outside and because there's a lot more on the outside they actually cause a pressure against the plate. So that is an example of delta E, delta T uh, working in a uh, very interesting situation. And again, that effect is called the Casimir effect. Now there's a uh, there's an interesting book called uh, Molecular Quantum Mechanics, and that book is uh, by Atkins. Molecular Quantum Mechanics, and what I like in particular about this book is on page. Uh, 69, 96, it's on page 96, regarding delta E, delta T being greater than or equal to H bar over 2. He has a very interesting discussion, and he makes a comment, something to the effect of 
that that is true in a loose loose practical sense. And what is particularly interesting, going through some different uh, considerations, he comes up with something that he calls uh, 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 lifetime broadening. And he gives an equation for that, and it's tau, which we had, delta E, greater than or equal to, I think he uses h bar, h bar over 2. So he actually gives an expression, and he gives a very nice explanation of all this. And this expression is uh, nicely aligned. with what we had in part two. Part one. Sorry, part one. So these different things, looking at the wave packet moving by and how we got delta E, delta T greater than or equal to zero, the, the consideration of Noether's theorem, the consideration of uh, the Casimir effect and the pressure of two plates separated by 10 nanometers and seeing the one atmosphere. And then with what Atkins uh, does, it seems very reasonable to be able to use delta E, delta T. And if you go back to uh, part one, we had uh, the, the sensitivity that we got that we determined for the magnetometer, the delta B. If I carry, I, I really don't have to carry the greater than or equal to signs here. Well, I guess I will. Um, and we had one over four pi, the gyromagnetic ratio and the lifetime of those states that we talked about earlier. So if we bring that lifetime of states back over here on this side again and just call it delta T so that, that's actually that lifetime of states similar to what Atkins has. It's important to point out as I did when we talked about this that the uncertainty principle This is valid if we try to measure both these things at the same time. It's just like with the delta x and the delta px. That uncertainty principle applies when you try to measure both at the same time. We're not doing that in the case of the magnetometer. But the point that I want to make is uh, if you look at delta t, delta b, this is kind of like an xy greater than or equal to, say, 1. We could normalize things. So what is that? If you plot x, y equals 1, well, you get a hyperbola. So anything on the line or in here is valid. But things in this area here, then you would be violating the uncertainty principle. So you can get good sensitivity if somehow you could make the lifetime uh, longer, getting back to the talking about the magnetometer. But the main point here is to show the region with delta B, delta T, where it's, this is valid. So this could be delta E. It would look the same. And of course, it could also be 
and any others, and we'll just and with delta px, delta x. So there are issues. There are issues with the time energy uncertainty principle, but it looks like it's very safe to use. <laughs>